Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. My name is Desiree and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Dalek Second Quarter Earnings Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, press the star one. I would now like to turn the conference over to Robert Wright, Deputy CEO. Please go ahead. Good morning, and welcome to the Delic U.S. Second Quarter Earnings Conference Call. Participants joining me on today's call will include Avigal Torek, President and CEO, Joseph Israel, EVP Operations, Ruben Spiegel, EVP and Chief Financial Officer, and Mark Hobbs, EVP Corporate Development. Today's presentation material can be found on the Investor Relations section of the Delic U.S. website. Slide 2 contains our safe harbor statement regarding forward-looking statements. Any forward-looking statements made during today's call involve risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from today's comments. Factors that could cause actual results to differ are included here as well as in our SEC filings. The company assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements. I will now turn the call over to Avigal for opening remarks. Avigal? Thank you, Robert. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. During the second quarter, our adjusted EBITDA was $108 million. Despite a challenging market environment, we ran our operation well. I'm proud of the ongoing progress our team is making. Turning to our strategic priorities, as I have outlined on our previous calls, the key focus area are, first, safe and reliable operation, second, unlocking the sum of the part value inherent in our system, and third, being shareholder friendly and having a strong partnership. I will now focus on each one of these key priorities in detail. Safe and reliable operation is the core of everything we are trying to achieve. We have made further progress and achieved our highest throughput ever this quarter. Big Spring showed additional strong improvement, and it's on track to meet previously communicated throughput and OPEX guidance. Joseph and Robert will provide more details on this. Next, I would like to talk about the progress that we have made in our sum of the past efforts. We have announced a series of transactions that will allow us to further improve our position as a safe, reliable, and efficient refiner. On August 1st, we announced the sale of our retail business for a total price of around $385 million. We are pleased with the transaction and the value it unlocked for DK shareholders. Our supply agreement with Penza is for 10 years. We are building a great relationship with the company and exploring additional strategic opportunities. We intend to use the proceeds from the sale to improve our balance sheet and return cash to stakeholders. Now, I would like to cover the transaction between DK and DKL. We execute an amend and extend agreement. We have also decided to drop our interest in winked Webster into DKL. These agreements are win-win for stakeholders of both companies. From a DK perspective, it will bring value back to DK refineries. And from a DKL perspective, it allows DKL acquire high-quality assets without significant strain on its balance sheet. Today, we also announced a number of transactions for DKL. This transaction will enhance DKL position as a full-service crude, natural gas, and water provider in the most prolific areas of the Permian Basin. DKL announced the FID of a new gas processing plant. The plant is synergetic, highly subscribed, and expected to exceed 20% cash-on-cash return. We expect the plan to come online during the first half of 2025. On the M&A front, DKL announced the acquisition of H2O midstream for around $160 million of cash and $70 million of convertible preferred. 
The transaction is immediately accredited to DKL on an EBITDA and free cash flow basis. For synergies, the transaction should be in the acquired multiple of around five times. This transaction put us on a path to midstream independence and allow us to enhance the margin profile of our refineries and the asset quality of our midstream businesses. The overall impact of the transaction announced by DK and DKL is cash infusion to DK of over $500 million on a standalone basis for little to no loss in EBITDA. For DKL, it said high-quality third-party EBITDA of around $70 million, making DKL largely independent third-party midstream service provider. This transaction moves us closer along our path to midstream deconsolidation. We look forward to sharing with the market further steps we are taking on this road over the coming months. Next, I would like to highlight the progress we are making on our cost reduction efforts. When we announced our ZBB effort, we had a target to reduce our cost by around $100 million. I am pleased to announce that we have completed this process ahead of time and are exceeding our regional estimates. Robert will provide more details around that. In addition, we are looking at ways to further increase the overall profitability of our company. The new project is not just about cost reduction, but it's about making details structurally leaner and more profitable company. We look forward to providing you with more details in the near future. The final piece of our strategy is our commitment to shareholder return and maintaining strong balance sheet. During the quarter, we paid $16 million in dividends. On July 31st, the board approved another half a cent per share increase to regular dividend. Our quarter dividend is now 25 and a half cents per share. Before closing, I also want to highlight that the DC circuit overturned the EPA denial of the small refinery exemption petition under the RFS last week. Our petition has been sent back to the EPA for reconsideration. The case, along with the Chevron difference ruling, give us important direction to the EPA as it reconsiders our request. We believe the EPA should grant us the exemption we deserve under the RFS rule. In closing, I would like to thank our entire team of over 3,500 employees, especially our DKL retail employees. On a personal note, I started my journey in DELEC back in 2011 in the retail division, and I have special appreciation for their hard work and dedication. Now, I would like to turn the call over to Joseph, who will provide the additional color on our operation. Thank you, Avigal. We have discussed operations excellence in the past several quarters, and today I am very proud to share with you operating data results, which clearly reinforce our progress as operators and demonstrate improved capabilities of our assets. Bottom line for our second quarter, safe, compliant, and reliable operations led the way to a record high throughput of 316,000 barrels per day, and a favorable $5.02 per barrel cost structure for our refining system. In Tyler, total throughput in the second quarter was approximately 76,000 barrels per day. Production margin in the quarter was $10.11 per barrel, and operating expenses were $4.83 per barrel. For the third quarter, the estimated total throughput in Tyler is in the 74 to 77 thousand barrels per day range. In El Dorado, total throughput in the quarter was approximately 85,000 barrels per day. Our production margin was $2.79 per barrel, driven by low margin environment, increased backwardation, 
and a relatively weak asphalt market. Operating expenses were $4.12 per barrel. After successfully demonstrating our crude oil flexibility in the first quarter, the team is pushing forward initiatives on the product side, including products diversification and logistics to support new market access optionality. Estimated throughput for the third quarter is in the 79 to 82,000 barrels per day range. In Big Spring, the successful execution of the recovery plan is well reflected in our results. Total throughput for the quarter was approximately 74,000 barrels per day. Our production margin was $8.92 per barrel, and our operating expenses were $6.35 per barrel as we approach our $5.50 per barrel target range later this year. We successfully completed a Benson stripper project at the Big Spring Refinery, which supports consent decree requirements related to benzene in, in wastewater. We remain focused on people, process, and equipment to ensure progress and operation stability. Estimated throughput for the third quarter is in the 69 to 73,000 barrels per day range. In Crowd Springs, total throughput was approximately 82,000 barrels per day. Our production margin was $7.02 per barrel, and operating expenses in the quarter were $4.95 per barrel. Plant throughput for the third quarter is in the 79 to 83,000 barrels per day range. The team is in final stages of preparations for our fourth quarter turnaround. Our implied system throughput target for the third quarter is in the 301 to 315,000 barrels per day range. Moving on to the commercial front, Improved but challenged supply demand balances in the Midwest negatively impacted second quarter group differentials for products and asphalt netbacks. For the quarter, we reported $34 million loss for supply and marketing. Of that, approximately $17 million loss was generated by wholesale marketing, $5 million loss was contributed by asphalt, leaving approximately a negative $12 million contribution for supply. In summary, after successfully addressing the liability gaps, our teams continue to focus on operational excellence and at the same time advance process, logistics, and commercial optimization initiatives for each one of our sites. I will now turn the call over to Robert for the financial variance. Thank you, Joseph. I will now move to slide 10. For the second quarter, Delic had a net loss of $37 million, or negative 58 cents per share. Adjusted net loss was $59 million, or negative 92 cents per share, and adjusted EBITDA was $108 million. On slide 11, the waterfall of adjusted EBITDA from the first quarter of 2024 to the second quarter of 2024 shows that the primary driver for lower results was from refining. The $64 million decrease in refining is primarily attributable to a lower margin environment in the second quarter relative to the first quarter. Logistics had another strong quarter delivering $101 million in EBITDA. Finally, the lower expenses in corporate are primarily due to our cost reduction efforts. Moving to slide 12 to discuss cash flow, cash flow from operations was negative $48 million. Within this amount is our net loss for the period, in addition to an outflow of $37 million related to working capital movements, including the inventory intermediation agreement. Investing activities of $63 million is largely for capital expenditures. Financing activities of $15 million reflects the 2029 DKL tack on offering, in addition to timing of accrual. This also includes $16 million in dividend payments and $14 million in distribution payments. On slide 13, we show the actual results of the 2024 capital program and full year 2024 forecast. Second quarter capital expenditures were $71 million. 
Half of this spend was in refining, primarily addressing sustaining and regulatory projects. As for the full year outlook for 2024, the original capital plan is on track at $330 million outside of the recent gas plant announcement. Net debt is broken out between Delic and Delic Logistics on slide 14. During the quarter, we drew $96 million of cash and paid down $35 million of debt, ending the quarter with a net debt position of $243 million, including a cash balance of $658 million. Slide 15 covers outlook items. In addition to the guidance Joseph provided, for the third quarter of 2024, we expect operating expenses to be between $205 and $250 million, and GA to be between $60 and $65 million. Our third quarter outlook for operating expenses and GNA is around $272 million. As Avigal mentioned, this exceeds our original target of $100 million in savings through our cost reduction efforts on a run rate basis. As to other guidance, DNA is expected to be between $90 and $95 million, and net interest expense to be between $80 and $85 million. We will now open the line for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have dialed in and would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad to raise your hand and join the queue. If you would like to withdraw your question, simply press star 1 again. If you are called upon to ask your question and are listening via speakerphone on your device, please pick up your handset to ensure that your phone is not on mute when asking your question. Again, press star 1 to join the queue. Your first question comes from the line of Manav Gupta with UBS. Your line is open. Uh, hey, guys, since you just spoke about it, I'm going to start with slide uh, 14 itself. I'm um, trying to understand here, um, obviously, there's a big difference between, you know, delic debt and consolidated debt. And, and so what more can be done uh, in this year? And so... Eventually, you know, you basically get to a situation where those two numbers start kind of, you know, converging and you're not holding on to this additional debt. So trying to understand what can be done, more be done to deconsolidate that debt here. Yeah, uh, uh, Manav, uh, thank you for uh, joining us today. I will start with giving highlight uh, overview of what we're trying to do and I will get exactly to the points you just mentioned. Um, as you see in this quarter, we have an unwavering commitment uh, to uh, show uh, investor uh, both the DK, DKL, the value of uh, some of the parts, and what, we, and we were driving to this uh, target very aggressively. We were able to do in the same quarter to build, buy, sell, and deal with the complex, uh, conflicted uh, transaction between DK and DKL. All of that on the same time. That's a huge uh, testimony of the uh, our uh, commitment uh, to uh, to bring that value to uh, stakeholders along. Uh, with a strong execution uh, to do all of that on the same time. Uh, to be more specific, uh, Manav, you remember I've uh, said that over and over last quarter that uh, the availability of over $800 million we created during March, March and April of uh, uh, March and April uh, uh, earlier this year will create us uh, the ability to go to the next step. That's exactly what we did uh, this quarter we, uh, on the, from a DK standpoint. We improved cash balance. We have a minimal impact on EBITDA. And what we basically did on the third point of the DKL, we did economical swap of asset. Basically moved one asset from one company and to another company and vice versa economically and put everything on the right bucket and making ourselves deconsolidation ready. That's huge. Um, from a DKL standpoint, we uh, were able to do, while doing all of that, we were able to grow the EBITDA, increase third party income, and have seven year amend and extend. Huge steps. Um, in the future, you will see us taking additional steps uh, to, towards the consolidation. So th that was a huge quarter for us, and more to come. Uh, perfect. So you kind of mentioned about, you know, putting the right assets in the right bucket, and, and one of the things where Delic is flagged out as like the EBITDA per barrel is less competitive versus some of your peers. So trying to understand based on the transactions you have done with DKL, are some of those assets now going to sit within refining? 
So the capture or, or for the battle, like for the same crash environment, would we should we expect a better EBITDA per barrel now the, that the assets are in the right buckets? Yeah, Manav, you got it exactly right. We were bringing back the volume uh, over time while growing the DKL, and that's going to improve the DK uh, capture rate in the refining. So that's exactly what I'm to do, and uh, you got it exactly right. So DK and DKL going to be uh, deconsolid- deconsolidation ready. You got it exactly right. Okay, and sorry for the last last very quick one. On SREs, help us understand what your position is, why you feel you know you should be given those SREs, and, and to be honest, like does it really, really matter if the rent price is 50 cents a gallon? Yeah, uh, so uh, we were very uh, pleased with the court ruling um, uh, 10 days ago. It was on Friday. Uh, I think the court made the right decision, and that's something we need to get, and, and I hope we will get. But, uh, Mohit, wh- why don't you give some more color around that? Yeah, Manav, I think uh, from our company standpoint, if you look at uh, the Friday's ruling from D.C. Circuit Courts, it was a very positive move. Uh, from 2018 to 2020, I'm just going to give you some facts about you know how it has played out for us. From 2018 to 2020, uh, nine petitions were uh, denied for us. And in order for us to meet uh, the requirements under the RFS, we spent approximately $300 million during uh, that time. We're still eligible after 2021 to apply for more SREs, uh, but we have not done that. But between 2018 and 2020, we spent $300 million to uh, meet our obligations under the RFS requirement. We don't know what's going to happen from here. Uh, EPA, EPA can appeal more. But uh, we think this court ruling is extremely positive, and that's how we are doing it so far. So congrats on all the restructuring, and congratulations to Mohit on his new role. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we're excited about it. He's excited about it. You're excited about it. We're in good shape. <laughs> Our next question comes from the line of Joe Leitch with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my questions, and congrats on progressing the, some of the parts effort um, here. Uh, so I, I know you touched on it a bit in the, in the prepared remarks, but I just was hoping to dive into uh, a little bit more on the use of proceeds from the transactions. Just I, I know you mentioned putting on the, on towards the balance sheet. How much is there to go uh, on that front? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I will touch on that gladly. Uh, we have communicated in the past about our cash, uh, cash allocation strategy. Just to remind everyone, uh, dividend maintain strong growing dividend throughout the cycle. We just increased our dividend again uh, by 2% this, uh, this uh, last, uh, last few days, so we are very proud of our ability to maintain, sustain, and grow our, uh, our uh, dividend. Uh, we have a balanced approach between improving the balance sheet and the buyback. Uh, we see a lot of value in our share price, and we'll give more details on that once transactions are closed uh, late uh, Q3, early Q4. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, just just a quick follow-up. Uh, how should we think about the, the tax implications from uh, the recent transactions? Thank you. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, Ruben, you want to take that? Sure. Um, on the retail front, um, there will be some uh, tax leakage. Uh, it's not material, but we are working on a structure to minimize that. As far as the related party transaction, the taxes are residual. Great. Thank you all. Next question comes from the line of Neil Meta with Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Yeah, good morning, good morning, team, and congrats on, on the announcement today. I, I guess the the new corporate structure uh, really does help to simplify things in a way that I think it could be easier to do larger scale M and A at the DKL level. I, I'd just be curious on does this get you one close step closer to deconsolidation? Yeah, absolutely, Neil. That's the whole point of this deal. Um, we are putting the right asset economically under the right ownership and right structure, so that they uh, make uh, DKL, um, and we uh, prepared a, a full uh, deck for DKL, I think, for the first time that shows the DKL by the second half of uh, 2020, by the second quarter of 2025, going to be largely two-thirds uh, third-party income. So that's a huge step in making a real uh, 
uh, full value for all those assets. So the answer is absolutely. That's our intention. Uh, we, are, we have an asset in a premier location in the Permian Basin, and we are providing all products around it, uh, crude, uh, water, and gas, and uh, very uh, proud of the clear uh, strategy that we have for DKL, and that uh, value and M&A will uh, reflect itself over time. Thanks, Avigal. And the follow-up is on, on slide nine. You, it's, it is helpful to see the margins by asset. And there's a lot of dispersion here. I mean, Dorado seems like it had a little bit of a tougher quarter, and, and, and Tyler's big spring performed very well. So when you look at that spread, what stands out to you, and uh, how does that affect the way we should think about the go forward? Yeah, absolutely. There is extreme focus of El Dorado in terms of uh, commercial improvement because the asset is performing very well operationally. But uh, Joseph will give uh, more color around it. Yes, uh, similar to our peers in the second quarter, we faced uh, the following headwinds. One was low margin, including the lower capture that comes with that. Two is uh, increased backwardation, which increased our acquisition price. Three is co-product uh, weakness, which for us in El Dorado is mainly asphalt. Similar to our Midwest refining fields, we faced uh, an oversupplied Midwest market with the under seasonal uh, trends uh, for a uh, group in this. Um, on a strategic level, I want to make it very clear, we're very happy with our configuration. We believe it's healthy upstream and downstream. The team is doing a great job operating and optimizing the plants on a consistent basis. Our opportunity is clearly around alternative market access when the groups these are low. So what we have done so far, we identify those strategic market destinations, and we are now executing on the logistics and products offering aspect of that uh, execution. I'm, I'm really, this is not rocket science, and I'm expecting a in the next earning call, we will be able to demonstrate actual uh, progress and talk about our uh, path forward. And one last thing, uh, I'll say the obvious, in, we are five weeks into the third quarter and the Midwest uh, balances have improved and um, we definitely see the positive impact on both the refinery and the wholesale mar margins. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Joseph. Next question comes from the line of Matthew Blair with TPH. Your line is open. Uh, thank you, and good morning. I wanted to jump into the supply and marketing improvement in the second quarter. Could you talk about what helped you out there? And then, Joseph, I think you touched on it a little bit. It sounds like the outlook for Q3 is improving on the wholesale side. What, what about the asphalt side? Do you expect some tailwind from lower crude prices in Q3? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Matt. We do see an improvement, but Joseph uh, will touch on that a bit more. Please, Joseph. Yes, yeah, so on the wholesale marketing, again, it's it's um, when the Midwest market is not flooded with markets, we have uh, better options on pricing and moving the product, and you will see how the uh, results improving. On the asphalt side, we had a rough start of the asphalt season this year with the wet weather conditions that made the roofing and paving challenging. We're expecting to go back to the to the normal range. Sounds good. Um, and then on the uh, renewable diesel side, I think at one point there was hope that that plant in Bakersfield would start up in the first half of the year. Has that happened yet? Um, so it didn't happen yet, and maybe I will let uh, Robert, our uh, deputy CFO, to answer that question. He's closer to that. Yeah, I think um, it's something we are we are monitoring. We have we have ongoing dialogue with them. Obviously, we we're monitoring their um, publicly filed information, and um, to date, no decisions have been made, and no decision has to be made until um, they meet some of the requirements of the, the plant coming up and running. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. 
Our next question comes from the line of John Royale with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hi. Uh, good morning. Thanks for taking my question, and congrats on the, the transactions today. Um, I want to start with just a high level, uh, some of the parts question. Um, it's been a flurry of announcements with, uh, with retail and uh, several incremental items with this print. Um, how close to complete do you think you are uh, with just some of the parts effort after these deals are closed? Um, you, you've mentioned more to do on the deconsolidation side of DKL uh, and presumably also on the third party side uh, to get that entity to, to fully third party. Uh, so you can talk about what, what inning you're in and anything else uh, you can offer on the next steps. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, in order to get all of those deals done, and you know that you're close to that, uh, you're close to the story long enough. You need to make sure the right assets uh, are on the right bucket, and we are starting to make those separations as we speak. Uh, while doing that, we maintain and grow the DKL uh, uh, EBITDA to make it a third party dominant and to make it uh, ready for uh, next steps. All of those uh, steps were completed. And we are ready to deconsolidation uh, when the op right opportunity presents itself. Mark, please, if you want to add anything around that, Marco. He was very close to those deals and was able to build, buy, sell, mm -hmm. and deal with all those uh, intercompany transactions, all of that on the same time. So, great job. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Avago, and thanks for the question, uh, John. Look, I, I think uh, you, you highlighted it and appreciate that, but the transactions that we've announced uh, at DK and DKL last week and today – you know, they do mark significant progress on our sum of the parts journey. You know, as you know, we've highlighted and are extracting the value of our retail operations, but I think importantly, which has already been cited on this call, is through the DKDKL related announcements, we're reducing that interdependence between DKL and DK. And with Wink to Webster dropping, the expansion of the gas processing capacity in the Delaware, the purchase of H2O midstream, you know, combined, uh, they will add substantial third-party business to DKL. I think as we consider uh, deconsolidation, you know, kind of down the road and the pathway for that, uh, we're in a much better position than we were uh, prior to these announcements. Great. Thank you. And then uh, my follow-up is just on the cost side. Um, I think you've mentioned uh, moving into kind of a phase two of taking out costs after completing the, uh, the $100 million early. Um, is there any detail you can give us on that second phase and what might be some of the components of those savings um, and anything in order of magnitude relative to the, the first $100 million? Yeah, um, so we are taking that very seriously. Um, it's going to impact uh, more aspects of the business. We didn't give guidance around that, uh, but uh, everything is in motion and will be more uh, specific around that uh, uh, very, very soon. So stay tight. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Roger Reed with Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. And you know, I'll add my congratulations on progressing the some of the parts uh, restructuring here. Um, maybe this question is for Joseph. You know, you've been working hard to get Big Springs up. You made the comments here earlier about, you know, some work around El Dorado. But as we think about bringing the support pieces back into, uh, I believe, three of the four refineries, what's the right way for us to think about that in terms of enhancing the uh, the cash flow or EBITDA generation of these units? Are you asking about all refineries or El Dorado Big Spring specifically? Well, I was more citing the, I, I think, the progress at Big Spring. You mentioned El Dorado, yeah. but I was just curious, as, as we think about, you know, deconsolidating DKL and bringing the assets back in, I'm presuming that's also going to be margin enhancing. So, you know, the the progress you've made, the other changes you want to make, and then what's the right way to think about margin enhancement from bringing the support assets back into DK? Yeah, well, Joe. So, you know, it is amazing when fixed reliability, um, not only in the throughput aspect, in the calculation and the OPEX uh, are more favorable in the contribution. It is amazing what we can do and what we are doing with our leadership teams. 
as far as uh, handling all the optimization opportunities for each one of the sites. And this is what we basically uh, uh, switched to do. We have, uh, we have more octane capability where we can drive more other bots from Big Spring to the right uh, markets. We can sell more higher octane products, including aviation fuel from, from Tyler. We can uh, convert some of the diesel we make to, to jet fuel. And this is what the system is driving these days. This optimization. Uh, Mark, do you have more to add? Yeah, Roger. I, I guess to, to your question, uh, and I know Abigail has stressed it uh, a little bit earlier on the call, but the announcements between DK and DKL, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, they're they're effectively an economic exchange of assets, sort of not uh, a physical exchange of assets, but amending and extending the contracts, you know, accomplished a couple of things, right? The extension of the contracts for up to seven years you know, frankly, removes a, a pretty big overhang on the DKL units and the uncertainty that we know existed in the market with respect to those contracts. But importantly, it also means uh, that we're, through the amendment of the contracts, that we're improving the overall, you know, DK refining profitability going forward and enhancing future capture rates, right? And, and to your point, that does touch uh, specifically Big Spring, you know, El Dorado and Tyler over time through the moves that we've announced today. Okay. Do we answer your question, Roger? Well, I think I think it's going to be something that evolves, but I'll, I'll take it offline uh, with Mo and and uh, but I appreciate your clarity here. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Paul Chang with Scotia Bank. Your line is open. Hi. Good morning, guys. Um, hey, Paul. Paul. I have to first apologize. I still want to go back into what Voyager asked. Um, can you quantify for us or that share with us with the contract extension, how much is the uh, lower fee uh, that the DK uh, will pay to DKL on a per year basis? And also that did you, I, I think maybe either I missed it or you didn't disclose, what's the uh, price stack that uh, you will uh, you sell the uh, wind and west uh, west pipeline down to DKL. Uh, we saw on your presentation you saying that DK DKL transaction net cash are 130 million. So we assume that is the selling price. And what is the EBITDA associated with uh, uh, wind and west uh, that you currently are uh, receiving? That's the first yeah, question. Yeah, Paul. Uh, thank you for the detailed question and. Uh, you cannot assume that the W W to W value is basically it's a one of series of transactions between DK and DKL, and we provide you guys the net the net number. So you cannot just assume that number. So the value of W to W there is a market for that, and it's a pretty uh, uh, straightforward board evaluation of that asset. You need to assume that we uh, reduced. Uh, over time, the contract between DK to DKL in the order of is going to be over time of order of magnitude of sixty million dollars that's going to come between DK uh, from DKL back to DK while DKL is building the EBITDA uh, with the with the deal we announced. So all in all, DKL EBITDA going to grow. The capture rate in DK going to look and be better because of the valuation of sixty million dollars that we have. And we still have like 20% of the contract to uh, down the road to a uh, deal between DK to DKL. That's the full picture. Okay, so you're not going to disclose to us that uh, what's the actual selling price or drop down price for uh, Webster and also the contract extension, I suppose. Unfortunately, um, I can't. I, I, unfortunately, I can't. Okay. Uh, the second question is for uh, Joseph. Uh, Brick Spring uh, that you've been working on the restructuring and improve optimization. As of now, that is all the effort essentially done. And other than say you're talking about how you may be still looking at send uh, different product to different market. Uh, other than that, from a manufacturing standpoint, is all the uh, changes or all the improvement you're trying to make is already done right at this point. Yeah, so I think on the cost structure, we guided the market to 550 target, 
and uh, this quarter we have about 85 cents per barrel over that in Big Spring. So the reason is we have several special programs still going on for uh, long-term improvements. As they go away by year-end, we will be at the 550 target, and we believe that will be sustainable. Now, to my, the point I made before, when you stop playing defense, you can uh, start uh, working on your offense, and we have a lot of great ideas in Big Spring. It's a, it's a great asset, and we have uh, a lot of uh, room there on the octane side and the feedstock side that we will uh, look very closely and uh, move forward. Hi, thank you. Thank you. And we do have our last question. It comes from the line of Jason Gableman with TD Cowan. Your line is open. Yeah, hey, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, apologies, I'm going to try this again on what Paul just asked in terms of some of the EBITDA con contributions. And if I look at what you've disclosed for the DKL transactions, H2O is 45 million of EBITDA. The gas processing plant, call it 25, 30 million of EBITDA. So that kind of gets you to that projected 70 million dollars of EBITDA uh, for DKL, and it implies that then Wink to Wex Webster offsets the uh, DK contract amend and extend. Is that the right math, or is there something off there? Yeah, so Jason, I think uh, it's a good uh, opportunity to do a follow-up with Mohit. Uh, we see more value in the gas plant, for example, and there is more rebid that it comes back between uh, DKL back to DK. I said that to Paul, it's around $60 million over time. It's not all of that uh, day one. Uh, so uh, we didn't give a specific numbers on each one of the transactions, and that's the reason we made sure that the strategy is clear to you and others that we want to make sure that the right ownership is on the right place and we are improving capture rate while growing DKL. That's the objective. And if you look at that holistically, um, we are tried, I think we achieved for the most part, to achieve on the same quarter deconsolidation ready uh, while uh, making a clearer separation between companies. That's, uh, that's what we're after. That's, uh, uh, in our mind, a very, very important step uh, both for stakeholder and unit holder. Okay, and and when you say sixty million dollars of value over time, how many how many years do do you expect that to take? Uh, we are not going to get into the details, uh, but uh, I encourage you to uh, get with Mohit and uh, get some uh, more uh, detailed questions. Okay, and then my other question is just once again on use of proceeds. You know, your your interest expenses. Um, it, it looks pretty high right now, and in, and in terms of improving the cash flow of the parent comp company, it, it seems like that's um, a great place to attack. So um, is is that kind of priority one, and why is there hesitance right now in just kind of talking through the, the use of proceeds? Thanks. So the use of proceeds is according to our strategy, and obviously when we're looking on free cash flow, we always – uh, look at that on mid-cycle. So mid-cycle uh, free cash flow looks, uh, looks great to our expectation. We have ability to do everything we need and to have a good return to investors. So we are uh, very confident in the, uh, where we are and uh, looking forward. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for the answers, and I'll follow up offline. Thank you. That concludes the question and answer session. Mr. Abigail Sorek, our CEO, I turn the call back over to you. Yeah. So thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you for uh, uh, the management team around the table for the extreme focus and execution around here. Uh, thank you for uh, our employees, uh, the board of direct, uh, directors, you the investor, and a special thank you for the retail uh, employees for a long time being with us. And uh, welcome to the H2O team that is uh, joining uh, our family today. Uh, we'll talk again in the, ne in the next quarter. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.